Hi there, I welcome you to the second lecture on the short course on basic radiobiology. In this lecture, we will discuss the cell survival curve, the factors that affect it and much more. The cell survival curve is plotted on a semi-log plot, by which I mean one of the axes is a logarithmic scale. For example, here the y-axis in a logarithmic scale and the x-axis in a linear scale. The cell survival curve is in which the surviving fraction is plotted against the dose, whereas the surviving fraction in the logarithmic scale and the dose in a linear scale. You can also say it in another term that the cell survival curve is a relationship between the fraction of cells retaining the reproductive integrity and the absorbed dose. It is the relationship between the fraction of cells surviving and the absorbed dose. We will discuss more on the shape of the cell survival curve you know, in the next few slides. The cell survival curve has got some advantages. Number one, it is very simple to describe. Many models have been proposed based on the cell survival curve. Steepness of the curve represents the radio sensitiveness. For example, if you see here, this is not that steep, whereas this one is very steep. I will discuss this in detail later. So the steepness of the curve actually represents the radio sensitivity. Difficulty lies in explaining the biophysical process. Let us now look into the shape of the cell survival curve for low LET radiation, mainly X-rays and gamma rays. If you look at the initial portion of the cell survival curve has got a shoulder and the terminal portion has a straight line. This means at low doses, some radiation go waste. You know, actually the survival doesn't you know, go down. So it goes really, really flat, which means that here some radiation go waste. At low doses for sparsely ionizing radiation such as X-rays and gamma rays, the survival curve starts out straight on a log linear plot. That's what we are looking at. The, the finite With the finite initial slope, that is the surviving fraction is an exponential function of dose. As you go little higher to few grays, the curve starts bending and the bending extends over a few grays, which means here actually the surviving fraction becomes less. And at very high doses, the curve tends to straighten again. The surviving fraction returns to being an exponential function of dose. So this is how the shape of a low LAT radiation, that's the X and gamma radiation cell survival curve is. That means initially it goes out straight on a log linear plot and then it bends over a few grays and then it again becomes straight. That means it's again an exponential function of dose. Let us now look a little more into the shape of the cell survival curve for the low LET radiation. As we discussed, larger the shoulder, more dose is required to kill the same amount of proportion of cells. And D0 is the dose that is required for cell survival to reduce to 37% of its previous value. Again, I think I told you in the last lecture, not by 37%, it is to reduce to 37% of its previous value. D1 is the measure of the initial slope. D0 is a measure of the slope at the terminal portion. So this is the slope at the terminal portion and this is at the initial portion. Smaller the D0 dose, larger the radio sensitivity, which means if this is smaller, the curve would be much steeper. That means it will be more radio sensitive. The cell survival curve for high LET radiation is different from that of a low LET radiation. As you can see in this graph, for low LET radiation, we had an initial slope and the shoulder and a final slope. However, for um, high LET radiation such as alpha particle and neutron, the cell survival curve is a straight line on a log linear plot. That is, it approximates to an exponential function of dose. 
as you can see here there is no initial slope or final slope or a shoulder it's just a straight line that is it's an exponential function of dose because this is a straight line on a log linear plot again d0 is the dose that reduces the survival fraction to 37 percent of its previous value we will look into some more parameters that could be derived from the cell survival curve number one is dq this is the threshold dose for a given population that often measures the width of the shoulder as you can see here this is the width of the shoulder and is measured by the quasi threshold dose which is dq it's actually called quasi threshold dose we have discussed about d0 that is the dose that reduces the surviving fraction to 37 percent of its previous value otherwise on the exponential portion of the curve the dose that results in 37 percent survival and the factor n is the extrapolation number this value is obtained by extrapolating the exponential portion that is this portion of the curve if you just extrapolate it and it meets the y-axis and this point is called the extrapolation number i will discuss something very similar to this extrapolation number later in this lecture there are a few factors that influence the cell survival curve or affect the cell survival curve one of them is the presence of oxygen the other one is the linear energy transfer otherwise called the let and the fractionation and the dose fractionation and dose rate we will look into these things like the presence of oxygen linear energy transfer and the dose fractionation in the next few slides before we move on to understand the effect of oxygen on the cell survival curve we need to know what this oxygen effect means this is also referred to as the oxygen enhancement ratio or the oer that is the ratio of doses administered under hypoxic to aerated condition needed to achieve the same biological endpoint or biological effect is called oxygen enhancement ratio this is also referred to as the oer that is mathematically dose of radiation required for a given biological effect in the absence of oxygen and to the dose of radiation required for the same biological effect or endpoint in the presence of oxygen naturally in the presence of oxygen the dose required will be either equivalent to this in the absence of oxygen or much less so the value of oer will be either be equal to one or greater than one before we move on i also would like to remind you about the oxygen fixation hypothesis we learned in the last lecture we said about two-thirds of the biological damage produced by x-rays is by indirect action mediated by free radicals the damage produced by free radicals in the dna can be repaired under hypoxia but is actually fixed fixed as a permanent damage irreparable damage if molecular oxygen is available so this is an important thing that we learned in the indirect action that is the damage produced by free radical in the presence of oxygen is made as a permanent damage oxygen enhancement ratio is actually a measure of radio sensitivity in the presence of oxygen and let us look at the radio sensitivity and the oxygen concentration required the oxygen enhancement ratio otherwise the oer increases with oxygen concentration as you can see in this graph it reaches a value of 2 for an oxygen concentration of 3 mm of mercury pressure or that is about 0.5 percent of oxygen and saturates to a value of 3 at about 30 mm of mercury pressure or oxygen tension that means only a small quantity of oxygen is required for radio sensitization as you can see here just 0.5 percent of oxygen that is about 3 mm of mercury tension produces an oxygen enhancement ratio value of 2. let us now look at how the value of oer changes for different phases of the cell cycle oer or the oxygen enhancement ratio varies significantly through the cell cycle the oer is measured to be around 2.3 to 2.4 for g2 phase cells compared with 2.8 to 2.9 for the s phase cells 
with cells in G1 phase showing an intermediate value between these two. Cells in G1 phase have a lower OER than in S. This is because cells in G1 are more radio sensitive and they dominate the low dose region of the cell survival curve. You know, they are more radio sensitive. So actually the effect of OER is not very high as in the case of S phase. And importantly, OER has a smaller value of 2.5 at low doses. That is the dose normally used as dose, as dose per fraction in radiotherapy. This is believed to be the result from variation of OER with the phase of the cell cycle. We will look at it a little more in the next slide. The oxygen enhancement ratio also changes with dose. As you can see here, the OER for X-rays is about 3 at high doses and is possibly lower at doses below 2 gray. So if you go around 2 gray, the OER is not 3, it is much lower. The following two graphs explain you how the OER changes with dose. For example, if you go to a low dose assay, you look at that OER is it's about 2.5 here. That is the ratio of doses required under hypoxic condition to aerated condition for the same sur surviving fraction, the ratio is about 2.5. If you go to high dose assay about 10 to 30 gray, the OER is about 3. That is the ratio of doses under hypoxic condition to aerated condition for the same surviving fraction is about 3. The OER for alpha and neutrons is different from that of X-rays. The OER decreases as linear energy transfer increases. So as LET increases, the OER decreases. OER approaches a value of unity for alpha particles. That means there is no oxygen effect. For neutrons, the OER has an intermediate value of about 1.6. The following graphs explain you the OER for neutrons and alpha rays. For neutrons, as you can see, the OER is about 1.6, which means the ratio of doses required under hypoxic condition to the aerated condition for the same surviving fraction is about 1.6. If you go and look at, at alpha rays uh, cell survival curves, the cell survival curve in the case of aerated condition as well as hypoxic condition, they both overlap, meaning the oxygen enhancement ratio is 1. We learned about the oxygen enhancement ratio and its effect on the cell survival curve. Now we will look at the linear energy transfer, otherwise called the LET. LET is the energy transferred per unit length of the track. The special unit for LET is the KeV per micrometer. The linear energy transfer of charged particle in medium is the quotient of dE by dL. So LET is dE by dL, where dE is the average energy locally imported to the medium by the charged particle of specified energy in traversing a distance of dl. So dE by dl is the linear energy transfer where dE is the average energy locally imparted to the medium and in a distance of dl. We will now look at linear energy transfer for various types of radiation. X and gamma rays are low LET radiation, whereas alpha and fast neutrons are high LET radiation. LET is directly related to the ionization and therefore biological damage is different for high and low LET radiation. Right? So LET is directly related to the ionization and hence the biological damage, which is different for high and low LET radiation. Let us look at the value of Lyrian energy transfer, that is the LET for various radiation types. For example, for photons, let me say for cobalt 60, it is somewhere between 0.3 and 0.2 is the LET, that is the energy transfer per micron is 0.3 to 0.2 keV. For 200 keV X-ray, it's 2 slightly higher. For electrons of 1 MeV, it's 0.2. For 100 MeV, it's 0.5. And very low energy electrons like 10 keV and 1 keV, it's higher. You know, as the energy decreases, the energy transfer is much higher. So, LET is much higher. Look at the charged particle. For proton of 10 MeV, it's 4.7. 
But proton of 150 MeV or higher, which we normally use in radiotherapy, is only 0.5 or lower, which is somewhat equivalent to cobalt and the high energy X-rays. For alpha and carbon, it is quite high, 166 and 160. For neutrons, 2.5 MeV, it's about 15 to 80, and 14 MeV, it's, that is very low energy neutron, it's about 3.3. We learnt about oxygen enhancement ratio and linear energy transfer. Let us now look at the relationship between oxygen enhancement ratio and the linear energy transfer. That is how the OER changes for low LET radiation and high LET radiation. The following graphs are the cell survival curves demonstrating the effect of oxygen for high and low LET radiation. For example, for low LED radiation, you can see that oxygen enhancement ratio is about 3. So, in the case of hypoxic condition, this is the cell survival curve. When it is oxygenated, it is much steeper. That means it's more sensitive. All right? Let us look at for a high LED radiation. For example, neutrons, this is in the case of hypoxic condition and this is with oxygenated condition. See, it is steeper but the difference is not much. The OER is only 1.7 whereas the OER here is about 3. In case you go for alpha particle, the OER will be 1 and it will be almost overlapping with this one. For other radiation like proton and carbon ion, we will look at little later. Here are some points that you have to note for the oxygen enhancement ratio. The presence of molecular oxygen dramatically influences the biological effect, particularly in the case of X-rays. Oxygen fixes the damage produced by free radicals as damage. Right? To produce its effect, oxygen must be present during the radiation exposure or at least at the lifetime of the free radicals. Right? So when the free radicals are formed, when they react, if the oxygen is present, they fix the damage as damage. So, these are important points on oxygen enhancement ratio. We learnt about oxygen enhancement ratio and Lyrian energy transfer. We will now look at relative biologic effectiveness, otherwise called the RBE. RBE is equal to dose of 250 kV X-ray to produce certain effect divided by dose of test radiation to produce the same effect. To put it differently, I would say RBE is biologic effectiveness of a particular type of radiation with 250 kV X-ray as its reference. If you look at the ratio, it is the ratio of doses of 250 kV X-ray to the test radiation to produce the same effect. It is the ratio of doses, but the end point is the same. So the biological end point is constant. The dose is not constant here. RBE is something very similar to quality factor we learned in radiation safety. High LET radiations result in high RBE. RBE of a test radiation compared with the X-rays is given by this equation as we discussed in the previous slide. RB is equal to D250 by DR, where D250 is the 250 kV X-ray dose to produce a particular biological effect divided by the dose required by the reference test radiation to produce the same biological effect. This is because equal doses of different types of radiation do not produce equal biological effect. For example, one gray of neutron produces a greater biological effect than one gray of X-rays. There are several factors that influence the RBE. RBE depends on radiation quality, that is the Lyrian energy transfer, radiation dose, fractionation and dose per fraction, dose rate and biological system or the end point. First, we will look at RBE as a function of Lyrian energy transfer. As LET increases, RBE increases slowly at first as you can see here. 
and then more rapidly as the LET increases beyond 10 kV per micron. So when it goes to about 10 kV per micron and then there is a rapid increase in RBE. RBE is plotted here in the Y axis against LET in the X axis. So this is the curve that gives the relationship between RBE and LET. Initially the RBE increases with the LET slowly when it goes to about 10 keV per micron, the increase is quite rapid, all right? And beyond 10 keV to 100 keV, RB increases rapidly with increasing LET. This is what you are seeing in this portion of the graph. In fact, reaches a maximum at about 100 keV per micron. So at about 100 keV per micron, you have the maximum. The, which is 100 keV per micron is the alpha particle, right? That is the LET of the alpha particle. It reaches the maximum. Beyond this, if you increase the LET, RB starts to come down. The relative biological, biologic effectiveness falls down to lower values. You know, this graph actually explains you the increase in RB with LET. This is for X-rays and 15 MeV neutrons and alpha particles. This is an increasing LET, right? This is a very interesting graph. Now we will have to look at why there is a drop after 100 keV per micron. In the previous slide, we saw 100 keV per micron LET has the maximum biological effect. In other words, the optimum linear energy transfer is 100 keV per micron. Why is that? It is because at 100 keV per micron, the average distance between two ionizing events is just about coincides with the diameter of the DNA double helix structure. For example, if you look at for 100 kVp micron, let us say there are two ionizing events, the distance between them coincides with the diameter of the DNA. That is why you have the maximum biological effect. But if you go beyond 100 kVp per micron, the RBA decreases. That is because some of the ionizing events go waste, you know, they are not utilized or we can call it overkill that is happening. So beyond 100 k per micron, there is a decrease in the RBE and 100 k per micron seems to be the optimal one. Hence radiation with this LET, that is the 100 k per micron has the highest probability of double strand break. That is because the two ionizing events produce the distance between them matches the diameter of the DNA. RB for fractionated doses is higher and for RB for single dose is much lower. For example, if you look at these graphs, the RB for neutron for single dose, you know, you can see that the cell survival curve just comes like that, very steep down. But if you fractionate it, then you get it like this right? This means the RBE becomes larger. Even for neutron, it's slightly like this. So the RBE is larger for neutrons if in, it is a fractionated regimen. So RBE for a fractionated regimen with neutron is greater than that of a single exposure. And the reason for this, the fractionated schedule consists of small doses. And for small doses, the RBE is larger. That is the main reason for fractionated doses, the RBE is much higher. We will now compare RBE, OER and LET. This is an interesting comparison. Let us look at this graph that as RBE increase, uh, LET increases, RBE increases and becomes maximum and then it goes down. But it is exactly opposite for oxygen effect right? As LET increases, the oxygen effect decreases. So for low LET radiation like X-rays, there is good oxygen effect. But when you go for high LET radiation, the OER is much less. So OER is lower for high LET, whereas RBE is much higher for high LET radiation, particularly at 100 kV per micron is the highest. We will look at proton beam radiotherapy. Proton beams for radiotherapy was first proposed by Robert Wilson in 1946. 
the RB of proton is indistinguishable from that of 250 kV X-rays. They are only about 10% more effective than mega voltage X-ray generated by a linear accelerator. There is only 10% more effectiveness. The OE of a proton also is indistinguishable from that of X-rays, namely it is about 2.5 to 3. So they also have an oxygen enhancement ratio. These biological properties are consistent with physical characteristics of high energy photon beams. Protons are sparsely ionizing except for a very short region at the end of the particle's range just before they stop. We will look at that now. This slide explains you the radiobiology of proton beams. The graph you see here is basically a depth dose graph of proton beams otherwise called the Bragg peak curve. You can see that initially the dose is very less and then it increases becomes a maximum which is called the Bragg peak and then it drops down. This portion that is the beginning of the plateau, the average LET is about 0.5 kV per micron. It increases and becomes maximum to 100 kV per micron over a few microns as the particles come to rest here. The LET component is restricted however to such a tiny length of the track. It is not for a larger area. It is very small length of the track. The LET is higher. The high LET represents such a small portion of the energy deposited that for high energy protons it does not have any significant effect. Right? So it represents such a small portion of the energy deposited that for high energy photons, protons it does not have any significant effect. What are the advantages of proton beam? For the same dose to the target volume, protons deliver a lower absorbed dose to normal tissues than do high energy X-rays. For example, you can see the dose to the surface that is in the shallow depth are much lower compared to high energy X-rays. The high energy X-rays depth dose will have more dose here and then it will decrease here. Whereas this one has lesser dose here and as it goes to the depth, it starts increasing. There is little difference in the radiobiological properties of protons used for therapy and high energy X-rays. They have very nearly the same radiobiologic properties, nearly the same. This includes repair, the oxygen enhancement ratio and the response through the cell cycle. You know, whatever we discussed about photon beams, they almost hold good for proton beams also. The only relevant difference therefore is the dose distribution. That is, it gives less dose to the normal tissue compared to the photon beams. In US, for clinical proton facilities, they have agreed that the RBE will be 1.1 for protons in the SOBP region that is the spread out Bragg peak area the RB will be taken as 1.1 this is what they have agreed in the US. Carbon ions one of the interesting thing is the carbon ion in the case of carbon ion dose is almost constant until close to the end of the range and then there is a Bragg peak very much similar to that of a proton beam. Heavy ions including carbon ions differ from both protons and X-rays in the radiobiologic properties. The radiobiologic properties are very different compared to protons as well as X-rays for the heavy ions that is the carbon ion and other heavy ions. This is an account of their higher LET. They have very high LET. You remember saying it is about 160 to 166 we discussed when we looked at the table. The relative biologic effect of carbon ion, there is a rapid increase close to the end of the range of the carbon beam, carbon ion beam. As you can see, there is a rapid increase of RBE close to the Bragg peak. You know, this is the Bragg peak region. So the RBE increases at this region. The LET is low in the plateau region just before the Bragg peak and it is maximum at the Bragg peak region. You can also notice a tail which you didn't notice in the case of proton beam and this tail is due to nuclear fragment. So this is the contribution from the nuclear fragment. The cell survival curve for carbon ion changes with the energy. For high energy carbon ions, the survival curve has a broad shoulder similar to X-rays. As you can see, for high energy carbon ion and X-ray, the survival curves are 
very nearly the same. Whereas for low energy carbon, the survival curve is very different. It is like a high LED radiation one. This indicates there is repair of sublethal damage and high energy copper ions have characteristic of low LET radiation. So high energy copper ions have something very similar to the low LET radiation. At Bragg peak, that is at the end of the range, the response is of a high LET radiation. So at the Bragg peak, it behaves like a high LET radiation. If you compare proton and carbon ion cell survival curve, at the entrance of the plateau, both are matched. That is, the proton and carbon ion have very similar properties as far as the normal tissues are concerned. Significantly greater level of cell killing in the SOBP region for carbon ions than for protons. So that's what you can see here. There is more of cell killing for carbon ions compared to the proton beam at the SOBP region. That is the spread out Bragg peak region. These are some of the points to remember about carbon ions. The LET of carbon ions stays low in the entrance plateau in the normal tissue, allowing repair to take place as in the case of X-rays. Whereas the RBA maximum coincides with the Bragg peak. The maximum RBA is with the Bragg peak. Carbon ions are relatively stable and have a smaller nuclear fragmentation tail beyond the Bragg peak. Compared with protons, when you compare with protons, carbon ions have less lateral scattering. Therefore, it has got sharper beam edges. Carbon ions have sharper beam edges. Thank you very much. As usual, you will have some MCQs after this lecture. Please do them before you go on to the next one.